Last week, we looked at Mary of Bethany, that devoted woman who, in some small way, saw what lay ahead for Jesus and with gratitude and devotion anointed him, preparing him for his burial. Today, we turn our attention to one of Jesus' chosen disciples, Judas Iscariot, who, through his betrayal, set in motion a series of events that led to Christ's crucifixion. Now, the Gospels were written years after the events took place. The authors are reflecting on the people and events, and so sometimes include some editorial explanations. And such is the case when they speak of Judas. When he is identified, it is with the descriptor of being Jesus' betrayer. While God used Judas' act of betrayal to bring about his redemptive plan, his actions were very personal. They were very personal to the other disciples. But until that time, he was just one of the twelve, learning from the rabbi, traveling around with others, and following Jesus wherever he went. We see him as a trusted treasurer. In fact, the, the first time we meet Jesus, or Judas, pardon me, other than the lists of disciples, is at the house of Simon the leper. And we learn that he is a trusted member of the group and has been given the duties of treasurer. John informs that Judas was keeper of the money bag. So whenever someone gave them money to support what Jesus was doing, Judas was to take care of it. He would buy the supplies or give the money to one of the others to do so. And this was all done on the honor system. There was no bookkeeping, no receipts to write or checks and balances to the system. Now, Judas, along with the other disciples, are enjoying the dinner given in Jesus' honor after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And while the festivities are going on, Mary, sister of Lazarus, enters and opens a jar of expensive perfume and pours the contents on Jesus' feet and wipes them with her hair. And then John reports, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why hasn't this perfume been sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas voices an objection to what Mary had done. Perhaps the other disciples were thinking along similar lines. But Judas makes it look like he's concerned for the poor by suggesting that the proceeds could have been, (coughs) uh, or the perfume could have been sold and the proceeds used to help the poor. Now, on the surface, Judas comes across as righteous and compassionate. And I can see his fellow disciples perhaps nodding in agreement. But Jesus quickly defends Mary's actions and hints that Judas's motives aren't perhaps what they seem. First, Jesus declares that Mary's act of devotion looked ahead to his coming death and prepared him for burial. And then secondly, he says, you will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. In other words, the poor are always here. You can help them at any time. Perhaps Judas had not been so quick to suggest helping the poor at other times. And we learn that his true motives were actually not to help the poor, but to help himself. Judas was a thief, keeping for himself some of the money given to the group. Did the rest of the disciples know this? Well, probably not right at that time. One cannot see them keeping quiet about it if they knew. But later, as they look back on things, his thievery must have come to light. We next see Judas when he makes arrangements to betray Jesus. Matthew records, then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. 
From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Now, what led Judas to consider this awful deed? Well, certainly greed played a part. He stole regularly from the group's funds. He complained about the waste of perfume because he wanted some of the money that its sale would bring. And now he agrees to betray Jesus for 30 silver coins, which would have been equivalent to about three months' wages for an average worker. But there must have been more to it than greed. The Gospels do not tell us specifically why he chose to betray Jesus. Some scholars believe Judas must have been a zealot, or at least a zealot sympathizer. The surname Iscariot, some believe to have come from Sakari, meaning dagger. The Sakari were part of the zealot movement, which sought to overthrow Roman tyranny, and they went about armed with daggers, ready to use them on unsuspected Romans or Roman sympathizers. When they entered Jerusalem that Passover with the crowd cheering, Judas may have believed that Jesus would gather a force and lead them to victory over the Romans. But Jesus didn't do that, and his teachings and actions reinforced his peaceful intentions. For example, when questioned about paying taxes, Jesus not only spoke, had not spoken against paying the Roman tax, but in fact encouraged it by saying, give to, P uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Such actions and teachings might have disillusioned Judas, and he must have decided that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, so he had to be removed. Then we come to the Last Supper. The time had come for the Passover meal, and the disciples had gathered with Jesus, Judas included, to share this meal together. And John tells us that Satan had already prompted Judas to betray Jesus. Judas had made those plans before joining the others for this special meal. After noting this, John tells us that Jesus washed his disciples' feet, performing a very lowly task and urging his disciples to follow his example of being a servant to others. Included in the foot washing was Judas, who earlier had made arrangements to betray Jesus and who shortly thereafter would carry out the deed. And once again, I'm amazed at the love Jesus showed. But along with that love, I believe Jesus was extending a hand of grace to Judas. This foot washing was a silent call for Judas to repent of his evil and seek forgiveness. And later in the meal, Jesus dipped some bread in a bowl and gave it to Judas. Now, they didn't spread things like honey and peanut butter on their bread like I would do. Rather, they would dip bread into a bowl, usually of stewed food, fruit, and then eat it. To give to another and to eat together was a sign of great friendship. And so to receive the bread as Judas did was a great privilege. And I believe Jesus was giving Judas one more chance. He was saying, I'm your friend. I cherish your friendship. I love you, even though I know what you've planned. Then John records, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Judas rejects the hand of fellowship and love, choosing to carry out what he had planned. Now, there are some who suggest that Judas had no choice, but I reject that notion. Because God desires that everyone come to repentance. And while God knew the choice that Judas would make, Judas made that choice to betray Jesus of his own free will. What a dangerous path to give someone to Satan, oneself to Satan's control. Oh, let us not be fooled. Satan is real and he has power. I recall an encounter I had with that 
while ministering in the Sudbury area. We had a telephone helpline for people there, manned by volunteers with area pastors taking turns of being on call when they had more difficult situations. I was contacted on one occasion about a woman who had called in seeming to be very disturbed. So I contacted her and in the course of conversation I began talking to her about how Jesus could bring her help. As I talked she became very agitated and said things like, he doesn't like that. He doesn't want me to say that name. And when I tried to find out who he was, it was like there was suddenly a different person on the line. And suddenly she began talking in this kind of raspy male voice, swearing and carrying on. Well, I was startled and soon began praying in Jesus' name. And just as suddenly, it stopped and she was back to normal. I knew without a doubt that this woman was being controlled by a demon. And over the next several months, I had a number of conversations on the phone with her. And each time, the same thing would occur when I began talking about Jesus. And on one occasion, she told me that she had prayed to Satan. Just as in Judas's case, Satan had entered her. Peter tells us, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. While Judas had left after taking the bread, several hours have passed in which Jesus taught his final lesson to the disciples, and then went to Gethsemane to pray. Judas knows that's where Jesus will be, and so he leads the soldiers and mob from the high priest there and gives Jesus the kiss of greeting. This was a customary greeting of friendship in the Middle East, but Jesus or Judas, kiss of Jesus, made it a sign of betrayal. The one he kissed was the one to be arrested, Jesus. Judas is given yet another chance here, though, to, to change, to respond to the mercy and grace of Jesus. When Jesus says to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? By this question, Jesus is giving Judas just one more chance to repent of his evil path and seek forgiveness. But Judas carried on. And so Jesus was arrested and taken away for trial. Now, soon after, Judas realized the, high, the chief priests were determined to see Jesus executed. And then he had a change of heart. Matthew writes, When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. I have sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. And then he went away and hanged himself. Seeing that Jesus will be put to death, Judas suddenly realizes the enormity of his crime, and he's overwhelmed with guilt. He tries to undo what he has done, confessing to the chief priests that he had sinned and testifying that Jesus was innocent. But there was no compassion from the religious leaders. They have their man and are intent on finishing the job. They want to remove Jesus from the scene permanently. They're not interested in truth or justice. And so Judas throws the money down and leaves. He cannot undo what he has done. He feels hopeless and alone. He knows Jesus has reached out to him several times, but he had rejected those gestures. 
And now he cannot face his fellow disciples, nor can he face the Lord whom he has betrayed. And so in remorseful despair, he commits suicide. His greed would lead to two deaths, Jesus and his own. A sad and tragic end to a life that held such promise. A person whom Jesus chose as one of his disciples and in whom he invested so much time and energy. So what do we make of this uh, tragic life? What can we learn from the betrayal? Well, perhaps it's not what we can learn from Judas' life, but from Jesus' approach to Judas. We have observed that Jesus reached out to Judas several times. Jesus knew Judas was on the path of, to betrayal, and yet during that whole process, Jesus reached out to him in love and mercy. Several times Jesus said or did things to invite Judas back, entreating him to leave behind wickedness and seek forgiveness and restoration. In the end, Judas rejected Jesus. Would Judas have been forgiven if he hadn't committed suicide? If he had met up with Jesus after his resurrection, as did Peter and the other disciples, well, I believe Jesus would have forgiven him as well. Indeed, those words from the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, must include Judas, as they also include us. So two things then. First of all, let us forgive others. No matter how deep the hurt or betrayal, Jesus calls us to forgive, both by teaching and example. After teaching the Lord's Prayer, Jesus made it crystal clear that we must forgive others. He said, if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And Jesus' actions on the cross when he forgave his crucifiers, praying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, set us an example that we should follow. And secondly, let us be like Peter, not Judas. No matter how great the sin, Jesus still reaches out to us in mercy and grace. He will always forgive us when we come to him in true repentance and faith. So let us be like Peter who turn to him in repentance and true faith. And let us urge others to do so as well before it is too late. May the Lord bless you.